Hello and very warm welcome to the Arise interview, 60 minutes of big questions about the big stories from the news and beyond with fresh insights and critical analysis. I am Christian Nogodo and we're live in Nigeria's capital, Abuja. Thanks for joining us. Coming up in the next hour, protests are raging across American cities over the killing of African-American George Floyd last week by the police, causing an outrage that has spilled across the Atlantic to London, the United Kingdom, and reverberating into the African continent, torching freight nerves in the continent. There are growing voices of concern to strengthen Pan-Africanism. We'll speak to a professor and author of Instrumental Pan-Africanism, Professor Chudi Wazurike. And later, it is fascinating and scary at the same time to know that robots would now be replacing journalists. Dozens of journalists would lose their jobs in a month as Microsoft decided to replace them with artificial intelligence software. In other words, Microsoft has decided to stop employing humans to select, edit and uh, correct news articles on its home pages. How sustainable would this be? Can robots give good editorial judgment? We'll make sense of this story as we speak to an IT expert. Coming up, all in a moment. Fury, frustration in U.S. cities as protests turned violent. It is the sixth night of protest over the death of African-American George Floyd, who died in police custody. So much unrest in America, curfews have been imposed in nearly 40 cities, but people have largely ignored them, leading to 10 standoffs. More than 75 cities have seen protests with streets only days ago deserted because of coronavirus, throngs with demonstrators marching shoulder to shoulder. Police vehicles were set in fire and shops were looted in several cities. One writer says that the U.S. is witnessing the most widespread racial turbulence and civil unrest since the violent backlash to the assassination, assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968. Here's the governor of Minnesota speaking about Floyd's death and the justice system. Before that, a glimpse of protest around America. Well, Folks across uh, Minnesota and across this country, uh, as they gather to express their, uh, their frustration and their pain, one of the things they've been making very, very clear, they don't trust the process. They don't believe justice can be served. And their frustrations are they believe that time and time again, the system works perfectly well as it was designed to deny those rights and deny justice uh, to communities of color. 
We have to make that process work for people. This case is unusual because of the way that Mr. Floyd uh, was killed. Yeah, very graphic uh, videos there of the protest in more than seven of the six uh, cities across America now. And for more on this, Professor Chidi Wazurike, who is a political sociologist, novelist, and one of Nigeria's gifted writers, who has taught in several American universities, takes a look into the developing situation threatening race relations in the United States. Very warm welcome to the Arise interview, Prof. Thank you very much. Thank you. Prof, uh, the issue of racism, or what you call uh, Jim Crow, Uncle Tom's uh, Jim Crow, is not really new, uh, particularly when you trace it to the time of slavery, post-slavery, and the development or the uh, movement from the south to the north coming to Harlem, yes. and with the Harlem Renaissance and the rest. Are you really surprised that we're still finding, uh, you know, the Afro-Americans living in non Uncle Tom's cabin? <laughs> That's, well, you know, the answer is yes and no, in the sense that... Uh, Race has been the uh, critical American dilemma for years now, for centuries. And uh, there are no near finding a real solution. It's simply that the times have outgrown some of the primordial sentiments of the, of the core races that there's not much they can do about it. Black America has risen. Black America is largely working class and middle class today. And there are actually a number of bourgeois types and gifted uh, people who are African American and in very powerful positions right now. What you're looking at here is the beginning of what would be called the Third Civil Rights Movement. It's the very first one which began in the 19th century that saw people like W.B. Du Bois and a whole range of people. The Nicky Giovanni's, the right. James Baldwin, That's the right. Richard Wright with his black boy exactly. and the rest. Yes. And then the second one with Martin Luther, including some of the people you just mentioned, James Baldwin, Chino Achebandai, Wawati Pobel, James Baldwin uh, in those days uh, before we heard that he had passed away. But mm. there are civil rights icons. And what has happened is, okay, now you have jobs, now you're, you're, you're fine, now you have nice houses and so on and so forth. But there's no respect that goes with that. And whatever it is that African Americans have had to get, uh, whether in, in financial circles or whether uh, in business generally, or especially in professional circles, they've had to fight. And then how many people can really be there? Only a very small percentage. The vast majority, over 50%, are still in the doldrums and so on. So this is what has sparked up this... Uh, uh, that's the underlying factor here. You know, but the immediate cause is an example of the kind of uh, disastrous arrogance of the police forces uh, out there. Uh, and when we say this, remember that being Nigerians, we have our own problems. But let's, uh, let's work on America at this point in time. You know, if you remember during the last, the, the last year or last two years of the Obama regime, there was a lot of police shooting of young blacks and so on. Mm -hmm. So hardly any respect. And... Uh, the same police people who treat a black kid, a black youngster, with such disdain and violence. By the same token, if the young man's friend is white, they will basically cut off the person. So the double standards and, uh, and so on are part of the problem. Uh, it's institutional it? racism. Okay, yes. okay. Uh, uh, um, that's what uh, a lot of analysts are yes. saying. Yes. And, and you want to Systemic. look at it. Systemic racism, yes. You want to look at it again from the viewpoint that the... President does not seem to be helping matter. I'm talking of uh, uh, President uh, Donald Trump mm -hmm. in his tweets, his comments, and the rest. And given the white supremacist, you know, that uh, kind of El Dorado feeling yes. uh, and, you know, a jackboot uh, uh, um, stride mm -hmm. that they can match over anything and nothing happens. Yes. The short answer to that is that uh, President Trump is a, a very unusual president. You know, uh, he was a businessman mm. who ran for office and became president right away without any of the intermediating realities of having mm. been uh, part of the political process uh, as it were. So I think that uh, his style is uh, a bit in your face and so on. Uh, but in the, in the long run, I, I, I want to believe that he'll do the right thing because the situation can get worse if it's not well handled. And uh, that's an issue. Yeah, it looks as if it's really uh, getting worse the way, I mean, it's spreading in uh, virtually all the cities in America. Mm -hmm. 
But again, we cannot say that uh, the entire white uh, community or race in America are racist because we've seen mm -hmm. some videos of where even the police officers and uh, civil society, you know, mm -hmm. uh, giving respect to the mm -hmm. dead and criticizing, very critical, demonstrating mm -hmm. against that kind of inhumanity exactly. to man. Yes. No, that's a very good observation because we, we run the danger of imagining that everybody who is white is on one side and everyone who is black is on the other side. I mean, there was, as far back as 1940, there was a, one of the major civil rights organizations was C-O-R-E, CORE, yeah. Congress of Racial Equality, along with NAAC. There are white people involved. There are different people. There have always been liberal whites who basically have always stood with, with black folks. You know, but part of it is that they, 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 the power structure that determines ultimately who gets what, when, and how is uh, often conservative white and so on. That's the issue. So, uh, and I, I, I think that the gesture of the, uh, of the policemen, those who kneel, including the sheriff, including the high-ranking poli police officers, is, is someone we've never seen before. So that might help a little bit. But to your point that uh, this is uh, getting out of hand, well, remember America is based on the freedom, the freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. They take those things very seriously. So we can't be confused by the matches or whatever is going on, but there's always that fringe element, no more than maybe 1% of the matches, who will burn things, who will touch things, who will destroy things, and they're giving the whole thing a, a, a very the, bad that, name. That, that reminds me, I'm sure you read, uh, well, you are very close to the late uh, James Baldwin when he wrote uh, Go Tell It on the Mountain oh, or yes. The Fire Next the Time. The Fire Next Time in particular. You know, which, so uh, this is The Fire Next Time. This is The Fire Next Time. But it will be a different fire, largely because, and I want to point this, blacks have, have not lost out completely in America. There are black success stories. It's very important. They're part of the establishment right now. When up to the mid-60s, there were no black mayors. There are several black mayors. You can see that some of the people coming out from Atlanta, uh, even in uh, St. Paul's, uh, in Minnesota, and the whole range of people are black mayors. I saying, we're here. Talk to us. Mm. A lot of the police chiefs, quite a number of them at least, are black. Are black. Yeah. You know, college presidents. So it's not, this is not 1960, let's put it that way. Okay. You know, but one of the things we have to ask this ourselves. This is not James Baldwin's uh, 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 Harlem Renaissance. That's right. <laughs> exactly. The, the, Harlem, the Harlem movement and so on, you know. Uh, uh, but the issue of race is always there. Okay, Prof. Uh, we want to take some messages. When we return, we'll examine these issues, you know, uh, more uh, in depth. How horrendous can this be? How heartless can, you know, the human race be to attack, to kill people wantonly like this? That, that is the problem of systemic racism, institutional racism. In other words, every pillar of society in a race society is wired to the maintenance of uh, racial superiority. And the upholders of racial superiority are the armed civil guards of society, that we know as a police. And that's part of the problem here, largely because they can get away with it. The grand juries that normally investigate this would always give the, the police the, uh, you know, some escape route, mm. you know, some way of simply saying, well, maybe in the heat of the moment this happened. You know, but you can go back from this moment all the way back to the 19th century, and then you see the same thing. Remember that lynching was a, was a, a was black spot. Yeah. A black person may look at a white woman and say, that's, that's eye rape. And mm. suddenly, uh, one finds himself lynched, even before the police can come in. Mm. And the police, basically, uh, whether it's because of training or because they can get away with it, which is really part of it, or just out of uh, uh, sheer s s selection of the kind of characters who are highly authoritarian, highly intolerant, who are the, are, the, are, the, are the drop of a gun, who shoot before they ask questions. Whatever it is, this sort of police intimidation has been going on for a long, long time. And what you see going on now is people rising all over the place, black and white and Hispanic and Asian, simply saying enough is enough. So this is a historic moment. And that's where revolutions tend to start. Just, it's an, it could be an uprising, it could be an upheaval, and eventually might, you know, a lot depends on what the president of America does. A lot depends on what the authorities do. He's hiding right now. He's being uh, kept in a bunker in the White well, House. I'm, I'm sure his advisors are telling him this is not the time to make him send their speeches and so on. You know? let, let us look at uh, Baldwin again. I like quoting yes, him. Yes, Baldwin. You, you, the you, fire next time. Yeah, the fire next time, you know, is uh, two-pronged essays. Yes. Look at what he said. He said, how can the importance of love be stressed in America? as epitomized in his uh, 
the fire next time in one of the essays, yes. my dungeon shook. And he went on again to say, Baldwin, you know, had accused his countrymen of destroying and continue to destroy thousands of lives without knowing it or not wanting to know it. No, he's, he's right. And, you know, especially for people who grew up before the 1960s, it was simply a horrendous, life-deforming experience. The people of today at least have some hope. There's, a, you know, there's an international society, there's globalization. Uh, there are one or two things that can happen. Yeah. At that particular time, there was a color line. You can't, you can't become anything, mm. no matter your talent. Mm. Uh, one way to look at what Baldwin is saying, quite simply, is that uh, racism itself is a psychiatric condition. It's a mental condition. Mm. You have to ask yourself, why would somebody hate somebody he, he doesn't really know? Yeah, without showing Just, love. Without, yeah, without showing love, without knowing who he is. And um, uh, the only way to look at it is that it's, it's hidebound, it's institutional, but also in some cases, for those who go to the, ex to the extent of killing others, it is a psychiatric problem. And, you know, at some point we also talk about our own situation here. Yeah. yeah about marginalization, mm -hmm. about uh, so-called minority, majority. All these are part of the issues here. If you find yourself on the wrong side, on one side where you can have no hope at all. You can just be cut you down. Can, even. You, can, you, can, you can explode. Oh, yeah, we see that often. Let's take a look at Richard Wright's The Black Boy, yeah. and you see how institutional racism started in the form of boxing. Yes. You remember the yeah. two black uh, yeah. guys who work with those two uh, managers of uh, some company, yeah. and they would put a bed. The two white guys would put a bed. Yeah. Uh, Joseph is going to beat uh, Abel yeah. just for the sake of using the yes. name, you know, Sealy. Part of the manipulation. And that was the manipulation. Yeah. That's the, the beginning of and the history of boxing. Yes, yeah. Oh, and the whole range of things. Remember the jazz age? Yeah. The Harlem Renaissance? Absolutely. I mean, if you're looking at the contribution of African Americans, it's simply incredible. What you call American popular culture is black culture. It is. Most, including the, the, the rap tradition. I was, I was in Harlem mm. when rap was beginning about 20 years ago. Yeah. And everyone thought, how could that replace pop? Mm. But today, rap is a, is, a, is, a, is a phenomenon. Whether it's blues or whether it's jazz, jazz. or whether it's uh, rock and so on and so forth. Blacks, all the spirituals. All the spirituals and so on. And going back to a whole range of traditions since the 1920s, blacks have been number one. You know? yeah. whether, and the same thing in sports. I remember that it wasn't until the 1940s that the first baseball player, the first basketball player admitted. And even the military itself, you know, uh, they have made so much progress. And yet, right up to 1944, blacks were not being admitted into the army. Right up to the 19, late 1940s, for instance, their blood was not accepted in blood transfusion. So you can see so many examples of... Uh, the layers of racism. Layers of racism. That's, that's a fine phrase for, for that, you know. And it looks mm -hmm. as if the NWACP uh, yeah. seems to be sleeping, you know, maybe because of the relative... Uh, comfort or assimilation, yeah. I, I don't know if I should use that word, and uh, they've allowed, you know, abolitionists well, and others yeah. to take reign. I don't agree with those who society. think that, you know, black America is down in the dumps, and this, this is no longer the days of the slums. Mm. They're highly educated now. They, a lot have done very well, you know, but there's always a sense that the system disrespects them and doesn't hold them to do it. So it's not quite the same as in those days. But today, a lot of the activities are mostly at the uh, level of the Congressional Black Caucus. The NAACP was to win freedom of voting rights and so on, and that's been done. The, the Congress of Racial Equality had done its bit and so on. You know, there are new organizations that are... Uh, NAACP is still there. You know, but in terms of policy direction, the Congressional Black Caucus is the, is the key for today. Let, let us look at the reaction of the African Union yes. you know, to these uh, heinous... Uh, mother committed by uh, those white uh, resistance so and the rest. Yes. Yeah. Do you think uh, the words are strong enough? Do you think they've sent you know a very strong message as you know a continent to the president of America? Well, remember what you call the African Union is a new emergence on the global diplomatic scene. Uh, it's, it's wonderful enough that it's taking a position. Normally, with all kinds of diplomatic. Uh, mumbo jumbo, they will normally try to avoid taking a position. So I welcome their statement and, and encourage them to, to be a bit more direct. But what we need to worry about is mostly our own African diaspora. Remember, we have a huge, a significant diaspora overseas, and they're also going through this experience of not knowing how things will shape up for them, uh, as far as any racist is concerned. They're, they're, they're black people, and black is black. It doesn't matter where you come from and so on. 
So it's good that the African Union is having its voice heard uh, because this will have an impact on, uh, on diaspora consciousness in one hand, but also make it clear to uh, police br br brutes out there that these are people with a long, a long tradition and the government and the governmental structure that will support them. But what I would say quite simply is that, uh, you know, countries have a way of not seeking to interfere so much in each other's internal affairs and so on. You can see the Americans are getting very sensitive. They were very upset with Zimbabwe, very upset with China and so on. You know, but these are human things in terms of race and it, will, it involves every and anybody. And there's no question that uh, uh, the visceral reaction is universal. Whether one is looking at it from, uh, from Europe, where people are marching in London, or from Asia or from Africa, the question is, America is much better than this. It's the richest country in the world with so much going for it, so much wealth and so much power. Why is it possible that we still have so much poverty out there? And that's part of the lesson we also have to ask ourselves. You know, here in our own situation, wealth and poverty have become an issue. The proportion of our people who are very poor in Nigeria, in fact, we're so lucky that the poor is not organized yet. If the poor is organized, you know, it will be a war of rich versus poor in this country. So we have to take that lesson that we have to give people equal opportunity, uh, have enabling fields for everyone, and ensure that uh, uh, minorities are not marginalized or even called minorities in the first place. So well, if you want to build a nation, you have to build a fair nation. All right. If you have to build a nation, we must build a fair nation, a good place to end it. How I wish there was time enough. I was going to ask you of... Nikki Giovanni uh, and Ralph Ellison's uh, The Invisible Man, Nikki yes. Giovanni's uh, yes. poetry. Yes. Nigga, can you kill? Can you kill the sheriff? Can yes. you kill the sheriff on the white horse? Yes. But uh, <laughs> Prof, so, Professor yes. Chidi Chudi Wazurike yes. yes. is a political sociologist, a novelist, a writer, a lecturer in several American universities. Thanks so very much for coming to Thank